here's the next game that we've got um this is called ghosts featuring christopher lee let's have a look please wait i don't want to wait you're just going to play the game for me when you're ready yeah here we go okay are we going to get some sand though? I wouldn't mind some sand. Usually get some fancy music when this is when you get a video. Hello. There we go. Hello. I'm Christopher Lee. Welcome. It certainly is. To ghosts. Oh, spooky. Okay, so the reason I wanted to do this one is um, Count Dankula is currently doing a Mad Lads about Christopher Lee because he had a pretty awesome life. Um, I remember reading his autobiography a while back. It was called Lord of Misrule. And there was some cool shit, yeah, like covered shit he did in war. Um, he was descended from, like, um, his mother was a countess. Uh, he was apparently a direct descendant of Charlemagne. Marcus Grimalkin. Okay. And yeah, this is coming off, um, we had Halloween last week, so... Might as well keep doing Halloween stuff for a bit. Dr. Susan Blackmore, parapsychologist. And yeah, uh, Durs got me in the mood as well. I was watching him play um, Phasmophobia earlier. I'm like, oh yeah, do some ghost hunting of my own. Love John Nuttall. I love that too, it's all these like, um, apparent experts and then just a priest. Priests know a little bit about this sort of stuff. And I'm trying to remember if I actually played this on stream or not. I don't remember, I definitely didn't record it. And I'm not sure what's actually involved, but the music's pretty good. Yes, I'm autonomous. It's, it's like a robot Christopher Lee, I guess. Oh, they got one of those old school, like, wood fire ovens. Software design. Okay. <clears throat> kind of wish we could get rid of this, though. Transitions, sound effects, refresh rate. Okay, ooh, um, we're on to the thing already. Um, minimize export text book of hauntings picture. Oh, I guess you can just pull stuff out. Welcome to oh. Hobbs Manor, my friend. Please excuse me for calling you out at such a late hour. Oh. I trust you had a pleasant journey. Mark yeah. my words. Didn't really go far. An you know, just time put Twitch on. Got IBS Let me set up. Introduce myself properly. My name is Dr. Marcus Grimalkin, and I have devoted yeah. my life to the study of the paranormal. It is time for me to decide once and for all whether ghosts are reality or fiction. I hope that you can help me to make this decision. My visit to Hobbs Manor, a house that is world famous for its ghostly activities, is the climax of my life's work. I came here to gather the no, evidence. You, your of actual me. real life was Documents, way better than films this, Christopher. And records that I have painstakingly collected over the years. Make use of the research material that you will find inside the house. You will have to look carefully for it, as objects in this house appear to gain a life of their own. Use my findings to make your own decisions. Oh. If you join me on my quest, you may be rewarded with great knowledge, but be warned, you may not like everything that you find. Okay, I guess there's some spoops in here somewhere. Yeah, so what to say about Christopher Lee? Where to start on this guy's life? Um, I think, yeah, like, Ken Dankel has covered most of it. Yeah, fought in World War II. He wanted to be a um, fighter pilot, but he had, like, um, uh, some weird going. He, he had, like, visual blackouts. I've heard some people having him before. Um, so he wasn't cleared as a pilot. He ended up in... Um, intelligence after a while did some fun stuff with that um oh so yeah old vhs tape with we're going to talk to father john nuttall and i guess we ask him these questions 
Well, the first stage would be, I think, actually to talk with them. Um, we need to ascertain whether some people are actually, this is putting it gently, some people are actually more prone to spiritual... Yeah, phasmophobia, um, check, fans, maybe check this out, you might get some, some people, gameplay for hints. For example, are, are constantly seeing visions. I've never actually seen a ghost um, myself, but I certainly wouldn't dismiss the idea um, of there being um, such things, obviously. So the first thing is really just to ascertain. Yeah. Um, what yeah, because if you're a priest and you're expected to believe in, you know, God and spirits and, and stuff, the, obviously, you know, you'll believe in an afterlife them, if we're, that's um, where we're going. A, a kind of stepped service almost. We wouldn't call in um, the bouncers, as it were, straight away. Um, <laughs> call in the bouncers, what? If that wasn't working, then we'd probably progress to the next stage. And then the third Turn this stage up a little would bit, be actually. when. Um, we really felt there was just an overwhelming um, presence, and probably a presence of evil that we'd actually have to call <laughs> probably it specifically evil. Uh, a man, a priest who is actually. There's a lot of things in the Catholic Church the that we consider area, evil, um, perhaps of the diocese, who could actually and is authorized to to tackle that. Yeah, because there's a lot of red tape involved. Like even like the fictional movie The Exorcist, there was. You had to get permission from the Pope to actually perform an exorcism, I think. This is quite a different area to to ghosts. We're talking about a rite of an exorcism, which is more to do with the presence of evil. And really, the, the, the point of doing an exorcism is actually to, to make sure that that very presence of evil is actually driven out, whatever form it may actually appear in. Um, so a little bit more radical than the way that we would actually treat with ghosts themselves. Uh, perhaps I ought to point out as well that not everybody is actually permitted to do an exorcism. It's regarded as such a serious matter that a bishop in the diocese would actually appoint um, a man, normally a priest, um, to actually do the exorcism. Mm -hmm. It has to be, I actually talked with an exorcist a few years ago, it has to be somebody who is incredibly holy because apparently part way during the, the actual rite, which again I haven't witnessed myself, um, the demon <laughs> as it comes out of... Just want to point out I'm not an expert, but I can, I'll try and answer your questions about exorcisms as best I can. So one has to be terribly careful that one doesn't sort of trip into this lightly, otherwise all one's... Uh, Faults and sins are going to be broadcast uh, around the place. Because yeah. that's the thing, he's probably having a chuckle about it. He probably has seen The Exorcist at some point. There are two basic formats for... Yeah, I want to watch it again, because I one watched Sorcerer the other day. It's directed by the same guy, William Friedkin. aware of something within all of us that's not quite right. Um, I know it's a bit about, slow at the start, but yeah, it's, it's like, still a pretty good horror movie. Origin. I reckon. Um, we're talking about the very presence of something which isn't good. Again, if I could just illustrate that, I mean, this is quite a gentle um, little format where we would pray over an individual or a group of individuals and say uh, something like, Father of mercy, you led the man born blind to the kingdom of light through the gift of faith in your son. Free these from false values that surround and blind them. Set them firmly in your truth children of the light forever and we ask this through christ our lord amen that's more or less what i call an everyday um, situation not that we use that every day there is a second form though which is perhaps much much so we got going on here the active matrix lcd screen after calling made in the uk the so we got like a mini vhs play here I didn't think they existed because you need a fair uh, bit of stuff to actually, witness one you know, physically wind the buddy um, the tape around and stuff. It normally has to be accompanied in the case of the exorcist um, by a lot of prayer and fasting actually prior to the little ritual. Um, in the actual ritual itself, who's got a fast um, again, though? There is well, you obviously prayer, can't get the possessed person to fast. Usually, the laying on of hands to actually expel the presence oh maybe of that's what it is maybe it, all the priests have seen the exorcist and, and then very often nearly always you realize uh, they'd probably puke if they got puked water. on by the old Tim Blair as well the use of holy water is, is and like you're probably better off doing it on an empty stomach children of, of, of God so it would be if you like to 
install the presence of God within that individual and to cast out any any possible manifestation of evil. Mm. Um, and it's probably there's obviously the there's got to be a lot of boxes you'd have to, to tick off in regards to demonic possession. Second hand from the exorcist himself. Probably excessive can drug use. Yeah, rules the day out a bit. Thing. If, if the manifestation, the presence of evil, don't really so exercise strong. someone who's on like meth or PCP. Was done in a kind of an just got to let that shit <laughs> just let them dry out. Windows or um, what have you round about the actual baptistry. He was actually hurled against. Yeah, let, let me just interrupt you. No. I think if we went to the simple definition of a disembodied uh, presence of somebody who died, we'd actually say a ghost is is no more or no less than just simply something which is non-physical, um, non-material, can't actually touch. Although, again, some people have actually spoken to me of uh, almost like a spine-chilling experience of, of having felt somebody or something pass by them. Um, the, the hairs on their arms sort of stand up on end. Somebody actually described it as she felt that somebody had gone physically right through her and it was just chilling. Um, so I wouldn't say that ghosts are manifestations of, of evil. If we went one stage, if we took that as the, the bottom plateau, as it were, went one stage above that, we'd actually talk about poltergeists. A little bit more physical there. There you've got sort of things coming off uh, pictures and things flying around rooms and what have you but again <laughs> the general definition is so there's no like a mischievous spirit and not no religious reports to, um, on any of this sort of stuff are they just going and off the third movies? And probably the most extreme case they, they're, they're keeping it very vague aren't they? diametrically opposed to to ghosts is where one would need to think he's probably watching it in the background it's like now the best advice seems to be was evil to, to go into the light carol land yes yes that seems individual. that seems appropriate <laughs> well that was a crock of shit oh okay we go to the corners to back out um so who's uh, father john nuttall is a roman catholic priest who preaches on in the county of surrey He's fascinated by the subject of ghosts and has helped members of his parish in the past who have experienced hauntings. So all the nut jobs who live out in Surrey who just get, yeah, up to mischief, I guess. All right. Ghosts and spirits and religion. All right. Uh, oh, okay. There's heaps, isn't there? Majority of faith that are practiced by the population of the planet, except spirits and ghosts in some form or another exist. These spirits may be in the form of angels, demons, gods, or devils, materializations of human emotions such as good, evil, and holiness. There has been a universal fascination with death for at least 50,000 years. Archaeological digs have resulted in experts believing that the Neanderthals painted their dead with pigments and dyes, indicating that they believed in life after death. The ancient Egyptians performed elaborate funeral rites on their dead and entombed them with possessions, food, clothing, and even boats that would ensure a comfortable passage into the afterlife. A spirit defined in the religious sense is not necessarily an apparition that was once alive, as in the paranormal sense. However, religious spirits such as saints and angels are reported as being as seen as ghosts regularly. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, religious beliefs often cross into the realms of the paranormal. For example, certain primitive religions hold the belief that a person's spirit leaves the body during sleep or unconsciousness and wanders the earth. Uh, Christians believe that demons are capable of possessing a person's mind, and poltergeist cases are often linked with possession. Many faiths remember and protect the dead with offerings of food and flowers. Others attempt to bring the spirits back to earth by ceremonies and rituals. Uh, the Christian faith has its fair share of ghosts and spirits. Indeed, the third person of the Holy Trinity is known as the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Christians believe in an afterlife and that people can return to the earth as ghosts. Uh, the Bible refers to many spirits, including angels and demons, ethereal messengers to God and Satan, According to the Bible, any apparition that does not take the form of a religious spirit, a saint, angel, the Virgin Mary, and so on, has been sent by Satan to confuse or distress the living. Okay. Um, might just paraphrase these ones, just read out if there's anything interesting. Yeah, angels, blah, 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 blah. Best unit in uh, Might and Ma Heroes Might and Magic 3, though. Oh, I do love that. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just looking at the picture. Yeah, angels just, you know, swinging his sword around, and there's, like, devils, you know, and just shoving babies into a little fucking wine press. 
I'm gonna make some baby soup. Um, okay. Demons. <laughs> I'm trying to have a shit, but this fucking moth demon thing's annoying me. Uh, bad angels, yeah, apparitions. Um, okay. You can expel demons with an exorcism. <laughs> or just... <laughs> Hold up a... Oh, it's like a... Is that an angel on a stick that's trying to pull the demon out? Is that what's going on here? I'm liking these pictures, though. Um, uh, Roman Catholic exorcisms often begin with a priest uttering the Latin words, Adjurete spiritus nequisime per deum omnipenitem. Uh, omnipotentum. Or I adjure thee, most evil spirit, by almighty God. Uh, priest must be prepared for his sins and weaknesses to be cried out by the demons, and he must respond... They're not really taken... It doesn't seem like they're sourcing this from anywhere significant. I think they've just watched The Exorcist and Poltergeist and gone, oh, there's some good ideas in here. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's like a, a thing here somewhere. <laughs> Look at this one, though. <laughs> Demon's got a little face for his dickies. That's cool. Um, Yep, Saints. Oh, and that's it for the book. Okay, what's in the folder? Oh, this was um, all in the folder, apparently. Okay. Uh, so anything else exciting? Stuff on this desk. Easter Island boys. What's up, boys? What's going on? Um, I, I should try and find all the stuff that, like, triggers Christopher Lee. That'd be a good thing to have. Oh, there As it you is. walk around Hobbs Manor, you will almost certainly find some portraits and films of experts like myself in the field of the paranormal. Tony Cornell has over 30 years once experience you know, in the field of paranormal and the mummy. study and investigation. He and has developed Saruman. a sophisticated ghost the detecting white. machine called Spider, which travels with him to the hundreds of ghostly locations that he investigates. Dr. Susan Blackmore is a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. She has a doctorate in parapsychology and has written widely on the subject. She was awarded the Distinguished Skeptics Award in California in 1991 and has been involved in the production of many television programs on the paranormal. Robin Furman, trying to remember is a trained psychologist. So this would be 96, so Christopher Lee would have been. He founded Ghostbusters UK in 1980. Really, 70 at this point. Died at 91, and when was that, 2016? Father John Nuttall is a Roman Catholic priest who preaches in the county of Surrey. He is fascinated by the subject of ghosts and has helped members of his is parish... Is he really, though? He didn't really have much to say on the matter. Hauntings. Anyway. Thanks, Chris. All right. Um, so, yeah. What do I know Christopher Lee from historically? I have seen the um, the Doobie Whacker. Um, so I've seen the original Hammer Dracula with uh, him and Peter Cushing, who he stayed friends with for... Pretty much all their lives. I know uh, Cushing died first. Um, so we'll get Hammer Horror. Should you see a portrait fall from a wall, look carefully at the subject of the painting. No. This unfortunate person may soon be dead. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Is the portrait going to fall Should off? Should you see... No, okay. That was, the per that was perfect horror timing. The... the, the Painting should have fallen off the wall. Anyway, who's this guy? It was on a, a Sunday morning, oh. very warm, very hot. And his audio log, apparently. Okay. And the group of people I was with went off for a walk, and I decided that um, I was going to play the trumpet. I was outside, I think I was playing Summertime or something like that, and quite suddenly I was terrified. Yeah, because I, I mean, like I really that. Like, was um, absolutely petrified. The whole thing with Christopher Lee was, I think he back. worked with. I was so scared. I ran into the house. It, when did he start? I didn't know why I was movies. scared. I he was. would have started in the thirties. What I realized because he did. Was, when I stopped playing, he was six five. There was six foot five. No so he was a um, at all. Nothing. He was a stuntman no to start with. He had a sword fight no pigeons, with Errol Flynn moving. in a movie. None of the trees were in a forest. The chance of trees not I got the shits with him because he got drunk and nearly cut off his bloody finger. No sound at all. Um, that night, was there? I was in bed. Yeah, Hammer Horror Dracula. I don't know what time it did was. Did the mummy through them Maybe as well? Three I think. Four o'clock in the morning. It was quite late, and I woke up, 
Other good and roles. Again, I'm trying to remember where terrified. what I, I first saw him in time. as well. I mean, I really couldn't breathe. I was... Uh, 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 and that was it. But I was... There was but yeah, apparently when he worked with Boris Karloff, day, he said, the, the, the two take whatever jobs you can. Just like, whatever acting roles you can trees. find. Just I mean, that's the thing. doesn't matter the subject, just do them. And it was... Yeah, he stuck with that mentality all his life. Like what it was. I mean, it's really. Yeah, he's he's actually really been in a movie thing. with Rep Brown, the the howling to stab a werewolf bitch. I think that one was called. They just yeah. Um, I've got to get matey on a red brand. Red brand is fucking amazing. Like not you know, for different reasons besides you know Christopher Lee. Anything spooky this in diver's here? helmet belongs to Mister Montague. He caught the bug for underwater exploration. Unfortunately. A rather large octopus caught him. Okay, so he's caught by an octopus. Maybe, um, maybe it's like the last game. It was like reading his thoughts or something. I don't know. Um, can we go upstairs though? Anything good in that? No, we checked the incense burner, didn't we? Um, there seems to be a fair bit involved with the house, isn't there? Uh, let's, let's look at these portraits, I suppose. Well, it's a little bit close, isn't it? All right. Um, do you believe that one day there'll be evidence to prove that ghosts exist? Ah, and this is the opinion of each one. So let's try Robin Furman, Ghost Hunter. I think we're very close to it. Ghostbusters because, you see, the team UK, are skeptics. That is, we, we doubt, but we accept sensible evidence. Whereas people who say they're skeptics and don't believe, of course, are not skeptics. At least they're not scientists, because a scientist has an open mind. They're dogmatic. They're paranoid disbelievers. We're the true skeptics. We doubt in the absence of evidence. But I think we're getting there. Okay. It's got to be done much more accurately, with a lot more equipment, and a lot more analysis. And I think more important, than anything else with all that backup, the psychology of the people involved is very, very important. We don't know what causes this, but it does seem to be linked to, in many ways, people's beliefs and the circumstances they find themselves in. In, in other words, the mental state, I don't mean crackers, their, their, their mental outlook. From that point of view, oh, so don't believe nut jobs. Okay. we were talking about earlier can help us but uh, as for a breakthrough I s don't think I shall see it and I don't think my children will see it and I don't think uh, my grandchildren if I have any will see it and I'm inclined to think that it won't be a parapsychologist that will produce this phenomenon I think probably uh, an orthodox scientist will find something and the whole thing will fall. oh blah 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 let's check it the skeptic I think it would be very exciting if we had some evidence that ghosts exist. The problem is, I think what's most likely to happen is that we'll go on, on getting the kinds of so-called evidence that we've had for years and years. That is stories of people seeing things, this, apparently matching the up how things were in the past, but when you go and check, that, you can't Like those little on. bracelets made what of candy? What would really make a difference would be if somebody came up with a plausible sounding theory about ghosts. And most of the theories that I've heard just don't really stand up at all. They involve all kinds of uh, very strange ideas of energy or a vibration or a storage of information which just don't fit with anything that we understand and you can't do anything with them. What we need is a theory that will say, right, it's using this kind of energy, it's storing the information in this kind of way, it interacts with the brain like this, now let's test it. If it's true, it predicts such and such an effect, let's go and look for that effect. That that is how normal science proceeds, by putting up a theory and trying to see whether it can make predictions that, that come out right. Mm -hmm. If we had that in the realm of ghosts, we might get somewhere. Um, but it, it hasn't happened yet, and it would be very interesting if it did. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, now let's flick this around. Slowly. Oh, and this is the... Look at the... Oh, I can't look at the paintings. Okay. Um... I guess we'll work, go bottom floor and work our way up. Um, got a spooky, looks like a spooky ashtray on that desk. Oh, no, can't do anything with the desk. Okay. Uh, spooky skull. Hello, spooky skull. 
They'll look up your nose. Betiscombe Manor is quiet these days, but it was not always so. The villagers in this lonely nook of the Dorset countryside still recall tales of a terrifying scream that was said to originate from a skull kept in the manor. In 1685, oh, as Ryan Pinney, the Lord of Betiscombe Manor, was banished to the West Indies for his allegiance to the Duke of Monmouth, a man of acute business sense, <coughs> Pinney made good his exile and prospered in the godforsaken colony, accruing a vast fortune which was turned over to his heirs on his death. Two generations were to pass before any of Azariah's kin dared set foot on English soil. It was his grandson, John Frederick, who returned to England in 1734 to reclaim the family seat in Dorset, bearing considerable riches and a Negro servant from the Isles. <laughs> That's what However, you did back then. shortly after their arrival in the country, Frederick's manservant, Isaac, was stricken with a malady that racked his body for days and only eased when the wretched fellow approached death. It was on his deathbed that old Isaac, who had served the family well, pleaded with his master that he must be taken back to his homeland for burial, if not a terrible curse would befall the manor and all who lived therein. Take you back to Africa, a fuck that shit. Man, John Frederick was not given to superstition hmm. and duly ignored his slave's dying wish, discreetly burying his body in the local churchyard. Hmm. It was then that the howling came. At first, many thought it a prank played by schoolchildren, defying one another to remain in the churchyard after dark. But when one of the youngsters returned home, <laughs> ashen-faced and shaking with fear, after a strange groan emerge from one of the graves, the games stopped and few would enter the graveyard again. And the wailing continued, louder than ever. A wild, keening sound that chilled the soul and which could be heard for miles around. The villagers knew the source of the shrieking. But Frederick would not heed their desperate pleas and refused to disinter the remains of his servant. And so the howling was joined by tremors and thunderclaps that shook the very foundations of Betiscombe Manor. It seems as if Isaac's corpse had risen from his defiled grave and was hammering angrily at the doors and shutters of his former household. Why did you bury me with that clothes? couldn't rest in peace. I'm in the afterlife and my dick's hanging out. The din was appalling, but it had its desired effect. Almost. Finally, two sleepless months after Isaac's burial, John Frederick wearily succumbed to the inevitable and exhumed the body of his servant. In such haste was the deed done that Isaac's rotting head was rudely detached from his body. Yet rather than return Isaac's complete remains to the West Indies, Frederick shipped his body back for burial, but kept the skull oh, yeah, that's right. as they a ghoulish memento of the his Caribbean. recent travels. That's where all the, the European was explorers went in the 1700s, didn't they? And the Lord of Betiscombe Manor oh, no. retired for an early explorers night, comforted by the belief that he had done all in his power to appease Isaac's vengeful spirit. And a blissful silence descended upon the village once more. And so it stayed, until John Frederick's own death, a decade later. However, the new occupant of the manor, William Thornton, had not been appraised of the skull's presence, <laughs> and upon seeing its ghastly village, had it thrown into a pond Eat behind the house. He instantly learned the error of his hasty actions, as an ear-splitting scream rent the air and drove him to the sanctuary of manor. Quick were his neighbours to inform him of the nature of the cry and the penalty for ignoring old Isaac's wishes. I know the but young menu bar he has taken me out of the immersion a little and bit. And steadfastly rejected any attempts to retrieve the skull and let it defile his house again. No matter how much Isaac's ghost bellowed into the night sky or raged against the manor with his phantom fists, Thornton would not yield. Nor would he accept the accusation 
that Isaac's clamorous protestations were responsible for an unaccountable crop failure that year or for the mysterious death of livestock in the region. It was to prove a fatal stand. Ooh. On a bitterly cold January morning, the Lord of Bettiscombe Manor was found in a state of collapse by the edge of the pond, dressed only in a sodden nightshirt. Driven mad with fatigue, his spirit had finally broken, and he had stayed up the long night, raking the pond for the accursed skull to no avail. Hmm. He spent <laughs> the rest of his short, tormented life on a sickbed in the wing furthest from the pond, but he could not hey, shut out the damnable you think he'd get like a bull net or something? I guess they're hard to come by in the 1700s. Within a year of taking possession of Bettiscombe Manor, William Thornton, a man of rugged health and fierce temperament, was dead, having faded to a shambling shadow of his former self. After his <laughs> funeral that skull held eventually. many miles from Isaac's former resting place, a handful of villagers recovered the screaming skull from the pond, stole into Bettiscombe Manor under cover of dark, and restored the dread relic to the loft. And there it languished, content and quiet, for well over a hundred years, as each of the manor's subsequent proprietors wisely paid greater heed to the legend of the screaming skull than their ill-fated predecessors. Hmm. Most would never visit the loft, lest they encounter Isaac's spectre in a less charitable mood. <laughs> this big dong when Bettiscombe Manor the passed into the hands of Charles Pomeroy in the early part of this century, events took a bizarre turn. Oh, that's one of the story. Okay. The new owner, a modern gentleman of liberal disposition promptly removed the skull, now encrusted in dust and a curiously sticky residue, had it polished and reinstated the grisly heirloom to a more prominent position in the household. No, it was no, a well-meaning no. gesture and an effort on Pomeroy's part to return some measure of dignity to the memory of a former resident of the manor. He could not have imagined what followed. On the eve of Ooh. the Great War, a torrent of blood issued from the cracks well, not really of Isaac's torrent. new it's more of a trickle. veneered skull, staining the mantelpiece on which it stood, and the blood would not cease. So shocked were visitors to the manor that Pomeroy was forced to return the weeping artifact to the loft. There it remained, reportedly oozing blood, when the outbreak You'd think of the he'd war at least put it in a bucket or something. Catch all that blood. Peace now reigns at Bettiscombe Manor. But should anyone ever be tempted to remove the skull from its adopted home, old Isaac's spirit will scream the place down. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I did like that too. I um was doing a bit more research on the Dark Eye and um because I, I just wanted to find audio books of the stories in that. And um, I found actually found two read out by Christopher Lee. Uh, one was Cask of Amontillado. And the other one was, um, what was it, Telta Heart. And I also found Berenice, which was done by uh, Vincent Price. Um, can we do anything with this fireplace, though? Just look up and down the fireplace, I guess. Okay. No, that's, that's exciting, I'm sure. Um, no ghosts here. I vaguely remember there being jump scares or something in this. Oh, there's the credits in the nice, <laughs> like, a, a Elder Scrolls Oblivion font. Sure. F, a few people involved, I guess. Lots of contributors. Special thanks. Redgrave Theatre Costume Department. Yeah, cool. Oh, um... Someone at Psygnosis. Id oh, thanks to id Software for Doom. Keep pushing the envelope. Apple computers still make the coolest machines in town. Keep the faith. Yeah, right, eh? All video in Ghost has been edited with Media 100 from Data Translation, the way cool on online non-linear digital editing system. Oh, okay. 
is what you used on Apple. Yeah, I guess Apple would have had the um, the oomph you need to do uh, video editing back in the 90s. And so I'll check that book in a second. What's this portrait Approached the, the abbey, walking across the fields, over a fence, looked up, could see the abbey, and what looked like a procession of monks, or hooded monks. Couldn't see any faces or anything, but there were definitely monks walking towards the abbey. At this point, we uh, heard a cough. <laughs> Guys in hoods. Yeah, they're just monks. Sent shivers down my spine. And Not cultists as, or anything. As a group Probably of three monks. of us, we all turned and ran, and leaving the scene just as fast as we could. Having prepared yourself to actually believe uh, that they, they existed, to actually encounter something and, and feel something, then gives you the exact opposite of saying they don't exist, they can't be happening to me, they don't exist at all. It was very, very, um, very difficult to, to, um, to get your mind around it. There's like four history books about Surrey over here. Okay, fair enough. Um, is there any interesting books here? Nothing exciting? Okay. Um, no, there was something on the lectern over here, isn't there? Let's go to this book. Back to the book. There we go. The book of Hauntings. Ooh, spooky skeletons. Okay. Um, was that all that was in here? Can't actually read the book. No, oh, there we go. Um, yep, more spooky skeletons. We just said that England is the most haunted country in the entire world. What English castle or stately home would be complete without a headless horseman, grey lady, phantom monk, or ghostly bride? Wasn't headless horseman more... That was more of an American thing, though, wasn't it? Anyway. Uh, this book contains the legends that surround the phantom figures that have become such an important part of English heritage. Turn the pages and you'll be transported into the haunted past. Holy shit, that's a lot of haunted stuff. That's a lot of haunted stuff. What have we got? Abbey House. Ghostly Squirrel, apparently. Okay. Um, Anthorpe Park. Oh, maybe this is content they wanted to put in, but just didn't have time. Amen Court. Um, Dark Shapeless Figures. Arundel Castle. Uh, assembly Rooms. Apparently someone resembles Guy Fawkes. Okay. Athel Hampton Hall. Uh, Elmerton. <laughs> this is basically just, yeah. I've been playing a lot of Oblivion lately, and this is just Oblivion in, like, you know, text form with some pictures, I guess. Oh, no, you can actually... Oh, you can zoom in on the uh, pictures. Okay, that's good, though. Uh, Berkeley Square. Any ghosts in this, though? Made Living Out of Mr. Myers. Um... Barry Pomeroy, Covered Bettiscombe Manor, Bisham Abbey, Blickling Hall, Wally Rectory, Rambit Castle. Yeah, I like the, um, the photoshops on these are actually pretty good. Um, for the time. Yeah, because it would have been, what, Photoshop, I want to say 3.0, 4.0 maybe. And you can't have to, you can see a lot of the effects and stuff i i think it was tricky as well because it was the days before they hadn't figured out layers for um you know picture editing programs this one's just yeah change a couple of the color settings oh yeah jingle hall yeah rice college landon park yeah no that's pretty cool give us a hug yeah she's actually pretty cute i'd get a hug off her um, Cleopatra's Needle. Ah! Just hung herself off the bed. Yeah, right -o. Um. Dwarf Castle, Corpus Christi College. Why do I know that name? Rasta Tower. Grand Hotel. What? Hang on, what's this one? Curry, go back. Curry Mallet Manor? Ben near Taunton in Somerset. Um, yeah, okay. It's dead spirits. Oh, spooky. I oh, know that guy was imprisoned. Oh, it's just for... Uh, no, Guy Dacra. I thought they were talking about Guy Fawkes for a second. And spooky ghosts. Very spooky. The white lady. Rectory. 
Yeah, no, like, I, I gotta admit, the Photoshop's are uh, pretty good. It's just, oh, Aw, oh, big evil Dougie. Hmm. Yeah, I guess they got paid to put in a bit of effort. Yeah, just rando beardy naked guy, sure. Hampton Court Palace. Yeah, all right, that's a few too many hauntings for me. I'm getting spooked. No, we gotta, there seems to be plenty more to check out in the place. Go to another room. Whoa! Yeah, I must admit, yeah. <laughs> the door's shutting. It's been getting to me a little bit. Because um, I'm trying to remember if there was jump scares in this or not. I just, yeah, it's been a while. Like I said, it's been a while since I played. Does anything ever frighten you? Okay, go, Santa. The case at the empty haunted church where uh, the team and I went to look because we'd been told by various students and people that they'd seen figures moving in the gloom there. This particular church I didn't know existed, but when we went there, figures did move in the gloom. There were tombstones which had been disturbed. This strange mist filtered into the church. The atmosphere was intensely oppressive. That was probably the most frightening case that we actually went to. Ah, so you lost some sandy doing your ghost hunt and phasmophobia. Okay. Oh, there was one case I think that was interesting from the point of view that uh, my fellow investigator and myself were somewhat scared. You, you get blasey about this, but we were in a house, um, an old house up in the, the, in the Fens, north of Cambridge, and in a room that nobody would sleep in or live in because they said funny things happened to that, and they were using it to store furniture. Funny things happened in the house. When they put electricity in the house, they put everything okay. else but in that one room. And we're in there and sitting there, and we got all the other helpers, uh, actually members of the university society downstairs, doing a Ouija board, not mm. to communicate, but to get everybody round so that we could control them. And what? suddenly there's bumps and thumps coming. We locked the door uh, from that direction across the bare boards. And I'm saying to Alan's, my friend, and I cut it out. He's saying, just cut it out yourself. I said, well, it's not me. And bang, 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 we've got two torches. And we're shining. I mean, we've known each other for years. I knew he wasn't doing it. He knew it. But it got quite scary because it's a thump, 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 you see? And the last thump was on a brass bedstead over my head. And I thought, wow, I don't like this. And Alan said the same, more or less the same thing. People were making a noise downstairs, and we used that as an excuse to go down and tell them to keep quiet. <laughs> we got to the door, and we forgot that we had put strings across there in case somebody was going to take us for a ride. And we went through there and collided with that, came back, and as we came back, we heard a noise, and we swung our torches around, and we saw a chair going across the room and land bang on the wall. That was a bit scary. I think the scariest thing I've seen in a movie for a while, I remember watching um, John Dies at the End, where they covered, like, ghosts and poltergeists. I think they went down in a basement and there was a, um, a ghost. It did, Yeah, it had grabbed all the meat from the deep freezer to make, like, a meat man to chase him, and they try and get back out of the basement through the door. They go to grab the doorknob, and the doorknob just turns into, like, a giant black cock. And the dude grabs and he's like, okay, we can't leave. <laughs> Lots of things have frightened oh, that was me, but funny. not ghostly things. In the course of investigating supposedly haunted places, I've been down in cellars with no lights on and no torch, just hoping something will come out of the slimy walls. Um, you know, I've slept in several bedrooms where I've been told you know, no one slept there for 20 years, and I sort of go to bed and go to sleep, um, you know, wishing something spooky would come along. Yeah, because I'm wondering as if you child, actually do that as a skeptic. Like, apparitional type things and being frightened. Because if but you ever nowadays, came across something would, paranormal, if I see something like that, I think, oh, there comes an You'd kind of be out of a job. You wouldn't be a skeptic anymore. They wouldn't be sending you to all these supposedly like, haunted yeah, places to um, to say no, no ghosts here. This is the no, reasonable explanation. But of it might happen. I might get a terrible shock and, and one day go to a haunted place and, and, and uh, see that ghost that I so far don't believe in. Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, there's got to be spooky stuff in here, surely. Yeah, here we go. Oh, so here's the interviews with the, um, the skeptic. Okay. Vicky Clark presently lives in student lodging close to a college. Unexplained events have plagued her in the past few months. Hang on, was this an actual movie, though? Do we have to wait for this to scroll along? 
because I'm so hoping for a voiceover. I want Christopher Lee back, damn it. My name's Vicky Clark. Whoa. Okay, no, that October, was terrifying. And uh, <laughs> about three weeks after that, the event started to happen. First jump scare of the game with this ugly ginger girl. But they've both moved out now. One left the course and the other one's found other accommodation. So it's just me on my own now. There was one night, it was quite scary. There was us three I girls. I have somebody Andy Hissman Zalen. And no, um, one like of my roommates woke up because she'd heard banging around her head and she got quite frightened about it. And then she felt something brush over her face. So I got up and turned the light on. And we said, look, there's nothing here. It's all right. You know, we're just being silly because we were getting worried about it at this point. And so we all sort of calmed down and we turned the light back off. And then I got into bed. And when I got into bed, there was a toilet roll in my bed. It's, I don't know what a, quite how it got in there, but um, and then when I woke up in the morning, it's probably there got was on the piss um, and black, fucked around like with tarry or stuff in my bed as well. It was on my pajamas and it was on the cover black tarry and stuff it was on the sheet what? and it wasn't there when I'd got up to turn the light on because I mean I'd seen the bed and it was clean. <laughs> you um, so probably I don't know where that had come from either. Drunk. And drank like yeah, one day I went down spirits, to the toilet like rum and I or something the door, and had a big you and know, when I came back up, I've, I've, it had I've had chair shits after I've been on the piss right after the having door. too much rum. I mean, we tried to we tried to work out if someone could have done it, time. but no one could get their arm round the door to pull the chair in enough. Um, I don't also, we had some pennies on top of a desk one day, and it just sort of it flicked one and it spun on the floor and it settled down. Um, and also bottles fall off the side, but they don't tip over, they land upright. Um, also, I went home for a week, because I wasn't very well, and the girls next door said they heard a lot of noises coming from the room, but no one was in here, because I'm the only one with the key now. No one's ever seen anything. That's spooky. It just seems to move things. We don't quite know why. Yeah, righto. Righto, Dal. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Entertaining me. Poltergeist, introduction, case histories... German word meaning noisy spirit, um, unexplained phenomena, furniture being rearranged, strange smells, yep. Italian documents from the 6th century describe poltergeists, ancient Egyptians strongly believed in them. Uh, Repressed emotions of children, and in particular girls that have recently reached puberty may be cause, the cause of paranormal events. Why? Oh, they ju they're just going off poltergeist again, aren't they? Rosenheim poltergeist. Uh, continuing for almost two years, though. Hmm. Something about ESP, something in Miami in 1967. Um, yeah. I think that's all we get for poltergeist. Dr. Susan Blackmore is a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. She is one of the first British people to be awarded a doctorate in parapsychology and has written widely on the subject. She was awarded the Distinguished Skeptics Award in California in 1991 and has been involved in the production of many television programs on the paranormal. Okay. Oh, it's just the thing about all of them. Tony Cornell has over 30 years' experience in the field of paranormal study and investigation has developed a sophisticated ghost detecting machine called Spider, spontaneous psychophysical incident data electronic recorder, which travels with him on to the hundreds of ghostly locations that he investigates. Um, ah, and that was just about Susan Blackmore again. So I guess we'd check out the videos. Tony Cornell's poltergeist experience, Susan Blackmore's poltergeist experience. Have you any explanation for the Rosenheim poltergeist case? Let's check with Tony Connell first. Now, there was one case I think that was interesting from the point of view that uh, my fellow investigator and myself were somewhat scared. You, you get blasey about this, but... We no, we've house, seen this one. Um, you were talking about it before, the, the spooky bits. In the fens, north of Cambridge. Was it? And in a room that nobody would sleep in or live in because they said funny things happened to that, and they were using it to store furniture. And when they put electricity in the house, they put everything else but in that one room. And we're in there, and sitting there, and we got all the other helpers, uh, actual members of the University Society downstairs, doing a Ouija board. Not no, we, we did do that one. One of the most interesting cases I investigated many years ago now was in uh, an ordinary council house in North Bristol. I was called there because the family had been seeing strange lights in the sky, 
and the UFO group had started investigating it. But then odd things the started UFO happening group? in the house. You mean they UFOs? were seeing strange things. They were hearing yeah. strange things. They saw the lights uh, swinging when there was no one there. They heard somebody opening the front door, but there wasn't anybody there. The clock was jumping along the mantelpiece of its own accord when nobody touched it, and the television was changing channels spontaneously with nobody near it. So they called me in to, to try and find out what was happening. I found a very pleasant and interesting family. I got on fine. I went there a day a week for many weeks oh. and sat there and watched. And of course, nothing happened. And I got them to keep a diary and I put various pieces of apparatus in there to detect what was going on and nothing was detected at all. I put a sort of fraud detecting piece of apparatus there and they didn't fall for that and commit any frauds, which meant that I could relax a bit about that. And then one day when I was sitting there, the clock jumped along the mantelpiece. And I thought, wow, you know, at last, something psychic's happened. Amazing. So I wanted to find out, was this to do with the position on the mantelpiece? Would any clock in that position jump? Or was it something about the clock? Was the clock haunted or the place haunted? So I thought the best thing to do was replace that clock with another clock and take the jumping clock away to my house. So I got them to put another clock on the mantelpiece, and I took the jumping clock home to my desk put it down on my desk, kept working, you know, day after day, and suddenly it went ch -ch -ch. And I thought, ha, huh, whatever this is, whether it's a ghost or something normal, it's in the clock. So I took it to a technician I knew who specializes in mending clocks, and he took it to bits. And he told me that it was a very cheap metal 1950s clock with a very heavy, old, dirty spring in it that was totally clogged up, he showed me, with muck and dirt and so on. And what happened was, you wind the spring tight, it all sticks together with this gooey stuff, and then as it unwinds, it sticks, and then uh, jumps. Okay. jumps. And because the clock's so light, and it was on a shiny tiled mantelpiece, it would actually move it a long way along. Huh. And that was the beginning of dismantling the story. It turned out that the television channels could be changed by various kinds of sounds, ultrasound, that could be produced by the rattling of a dog's chain, and often it happened when the dog was lying in front of the television. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, this was well the days when, you know, pretty much anything would affect and the TV. gradually the whole thing the fell CRT Now, ones. I still don't know whether really the, the uh, light, lights were swinging when nobody was there, as the people said. I never saw that happen, and I have only their word to go on. And that's mm. how it's always been. Things I've been able to investigate have turned out to have a normal explanation, and a lot remains that I just don't know. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, anything. Hang on, what was in this uh, briefcase up here, though? Just the briefcase. Uh, the Enfield Poltergeist case. Um, this is for the Enfield Poltergeist case. Poltergeist case, I should say. Um, oh, really? Oh, and here's actual recordings from the case. I only just got in bed, put my head down, turned the light out, and that lands over there. <laughs> and the light or something moved here. Right, well, that's the uh, front of the uh, doll's house. It's thrown right across the room, over the top of the bed to the door. Yeah. The doll's house is in no, the I corner. I want to hear about Bill. Let that's me hear you say my name. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Talking about an actual dog. Say oh. Dr. Bella. Come on, let me hear you say that. Come on, let's hear you say Dr. Bella. Say, say Dr. Bella. Now, if you squeak the bed, I can't hear you talking. Now, say <laughs> Dr. Bell. Come on. I can imagine them all just sitting there giggling behind their hands doing this recording. Dr. Bell. <laughs> Dr. Bell. I'm sure they're just talking to like an old homeless person or something. Um, 
So this is for the Enfield Poltergeist case, okay. The, the uh, secretary of our society, Ellen O'Keefe, rang me up and said, Morris, there's something going on in Enfield. Sounds like a case, Poltergeist case. Do you want to investigate it? I said, fine, yes, I'll investigate it. Thinking at that time that I would only be involved for about three weeks, little did I know. So off I trotted to Enfield and met these people involved in the case. Now, what had happened was this, that the mother had complained that various things as a PK, that psychokinetic phenomena, had been going on in the house. One evening, for instance, the children started creating... Go put in a lot of filler when you, <laughs> you've run out of money to pay Christopher Lee. And the children said to her, well, that chest of drawers over there is moving. Yeah, no, I do. Go to sleep. I'm kind of done with this. I sort of don't want to. I want to hear more about Christopher Lee. Hey, where's where's old Chris? A? You know, got to be something fun with these axes, surely. No, nothing fun with the axes. What about the clock? The clock does nothing. It's apparently eleven. Nothing fun in the fireplace. Look oh. closely at the cinders within the hearth. If you find any that are shaped like a coffin. There may be a death in the family. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. Good advice, I suppose. Yeah, there's got to be some fucking like, psychic Local shit going oh, on. Michael no. has assured us that the cat will make a full recovery. Oh, that's good. And finally, tonight's special report investigates a real-life haunting. The residents of this 300-year-old house, set deep in the countryside of West Yorkshire, England, have been experiencing strange phenomena. An apparition of a woman, known as the Nanny, has been seen in various locations around the house, invariably carrying washing in her arms. <laughs> local historian Norman Reed <laughs> I, I, told her When she said that, all I can think of is like Fran Drescher. ...lived here in the 18th century. <laughs> the true horror just... Witness Mavis Hartley is convinced that the apparition she has seen is the spirit of this woman. We have arranged for Ruth Brewery, a woman with psychic abilities, to visit the house to give her opinion of the ghostly events. She has not spoken to the residents before and has been told nothing of the events. Ruth's visit to the house proved largely uneventful until she entered the small uh, bedroom on the first floor. She made the following statement to our reporter after the event. As soon as I stepped into the bedroom, I felt a wave of oppressive cold come from the eaves and near the fireplace. I knew that this was a place where the spirit had slept. I didn't need to see well, if her. Oh, there's like a breeze. There's a cold draft coming from the fireplace. Probably I'm means you've got the shutter open. Anyway, it's sort of hoping for more spooky stuff in the um, thing. Here, but anyway, oh, look at these scary people. As I looked up on the top right hand side window there, there was what I thought was a face. You know, somebody looking out and those Room. Uh, I want more Christopher Lee stories. Stuff these guys. <laughs> he stay away. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we did. I oh know we still got to go through these doors, don't we? Um, so what's in here? Oh, kitchen. Yeah, we'll see what's going on in the kitchen. Yeah. Poison. Justice is often blind. And there are some who would sooner take the law into their own hands than see a crime go unpunished. The case of Nell Cook, the servant of a canon of Canterbury Cathedral, plainly illustrates the dangers of setting oneself up as judge, jury, and executioner. I actually want to find like one of the Nell Cook oh, yeah, ended yeah. house for the Perfect. new canon of Canterbury Cathedral. I'll let the story go, but I'm actually really was awesome for a way. I'll be back in a second. By deceit and gross impropriety. She had not always felt this way, and when the canon gave his first mass in the cathedral, she was suitably impressed by the character of her new employer. The old canon, who mercifully passed away after many years of ill health, was a kind but ineffectual cleric, more concerned with getting his meals on time than spreading the word of the Lord. Now, here before her, was clearly a man of passion, who had directed his considerable energies and charisma in the service of the church. And yet, 
There was something about the new canon, like the way he would never look her in the eye before he went to visit parishioners who had sought advice in spiritual matters, or his often extreme moodiness and irritability after returning from some of these calls. Nell put this down to his youth and passionate temperament, but she would soon find out the depths of his feelings. The canon was a man who kept odd hours, and it was difficult for Nell to arrange meals at set times. One evening, after watching the stew she had laboured over all afternoon <laughs> grow cold on the dresser, she decided to wait for him to come home so that she could broach the matter forthwith. Late that night, Nell was drifting in and out of sleep in the kitchen when she heard Wake a up. scuffle of feet and whispered giggling from the drawing room upstairs. Oh, not the whispered giggling. She couldn't believe it was the cannon. She crept up the stairs How do you to giggle catch and whisper at the same the time, by the way? and was sickened to the stomach by the sight that greeted her eyes. The young canon, obviously inebriated, was on the settle being very familiar with a young woman. But the real shock came when the priest's companion turned around, revealing herself as none other than his own niece. Ooh, okay. Nell could bear the scene no longer, and stole off to her own room to a fitful rest. In the morning, the niece was nowhere to be seen, and the canon seemed in particularly high spirits. His hypocrisy appalled Nell, and she had to take her leave with some feeble excuse about tending to something on the stove. In the kitchen, her sanctuary, Nell brooded over the night's events. She decided to bide her time, as this might be a isolated indiscretion, not uncommon amongst men of the cloth. Okay. But deep down, oh, he's she a priest the as worst, well. Okay, and her instincts know what they meant by canon. was soon borne out. The canon's niece started making more frequent calls on her uncle at his quarters, and their conduct together became more brazen and unforgivable. It was not something Nell could discuss with anyone else, so she resolved to deal with the matter herself. One evening, when she expected the canon's niece for dinner. She expressly made the priest his favourite meal, mutton pie, emptying a bottle of arsenic into the filling, and grimly smiling at the irony of it all. After serving the pie, to him, <laughs> Nell That's... waited by the dining room door, wondering at the effects of her special repast. But nothing happened. After the meal, which seemed to go on forever, the canon congratulated her on an excellent dinner, as usual, and said that he and his niece would retire to the study where she would help him work on tomorrow's sermon. Nell hurried to the kitchen to check that she had used the right bottle when she heard a cry from above. The <laughs> oh, no, I used incest the juice The poison instead. must be doing no. its mischief. And so Nell took her time responding to the desperate pleas for help. When she reached the room, she found the canon and his niece writhing on the floor in agony, foam the colour of sage forming around their mouths and their eyes wide with terror and supplication. But Nell simply watched them with a curious detachment, as if none of this was... Hey, really getting happened, rid of the bodies now. ...bade them good night and retired <laughs> to bed. No, bitches, you're dead. Yet her awakening was violent, resting her from a deep slumber. Upon opening her uh, eyes, uh, she uh, saw uh, a crowd of people in her room. I didn't get a rump out of that guy. Tones, get and that the most uh, vehement uh, amongst uh, them uh, was the man now shaking her roughly by the shoulders. Still drowsy, Nell could not fathom what her assailant was babbling, but when he mentioned the poison, the hairs rose on the back of her neck, and she recalled her actions. Yeah, I can't remember why he actually night. kept arsenic in the house. Oh, seemed... Possibly rat poison or something like now, that? Now, fully roused, she attempted to explain, to defend herself. But those gathered in her room were well past listening and only sought vengeance for the slaying of their priest. Nell was dragged from bed and into the streets, where the people who had once been her friends and neighbours turned on her with a viciousness that was breathtaking. Stones Good caught shit. her in the head and chest, forcing her to her knees, blood pouring freely from a gash on her cheek, and still it rained stones, 
pounding her into the ground, her arms uselessly hanging by her sides, and then succumbed to the darkness. If only that were the end of it. Oh, shit. On regaining consciousness, Nell found herself at the bottom of a deep pit, looking up at her tormentors, some of whom had shovels in their hands. She desperately tried to raise herself, railing against her attackers and accusing the priest of terrible sins, but their response to this blasphemy <laughs> was a clump of earth that hit her hard in the face, yeah. <laughs> filling her mouth That's and always how it goes, isn't it? Heel. And the priest was having incest the the, oh, whoop, of dirt just get a big on her. fucking thing of dirt and in her face. the next, until her body was covered by damp, cool soil. The last thing she saw through the clod of mud... Oh, did she cut the arsenic bottle in the face? ...was the poison bottle being thrown into the grave with her. Hmm. And then the darkness truly closed in. Forever. Oh. The passage between the old infirmary cloister and the green... It's really a ghost story, though, what was it? ...is known as the Dark Entry. And Nell Cook's spirit is set to wander through oh, this okay. floating corridor, lamenting the injustice of her fate. It is also said that any who look upon the wretched apparition will soon taste death themselves. Oh. Well, yeah, it'll probably happen if you eat one of her arsenic mutton pies, I guess. That's usually how it goes down. Um, oh, okay. That's not what I was expecting to see in the teapot. If you have ever broken a glass whilst drinking, you will have experienced an omen of death. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, I've broken a window whilst drunk. I don't know if anyone died, though. Are you sure you want to leave the house now? No, not quite yet. We've got lots of stuff to check out. Collection of exquisite imagery from some of England's most haunted sites. Oh, we get an actual video slideshow for this one. There we go. Oh, no, no voiceover, though. Okay. <clears throat> A bit lazy, they don't seem to have gone anywhere besides um, Surrey to check all this stuff out. I am sad. <laughs> He's brought some uh, Japanese dango though. Good. These are haunted sites though? Okay. Yeah, it's it's all very haunted I guess. Yeah, this one's photoshopped. No, that's just lazy. Oh, there's like an export option. Oh, that's what the thing indicates, the, the film reel. And this is just all the same stuff. Okay. Um, nothing. We can't turn from here, though. We can't go back or out. Um, not everything's locked off. Hang on. Copy. We have a start over option if we get stuck. No, it looks like we're stuck. Okay. Guess we're starting over. Alright, I'll do a speed run of this. Welcome to Yes, welcome. Back to the kitchen. Um yeah, because we're not trying to solve puzzles or anything, we're just kinda of checking out the house. Um just pots of pans, anything in the oven? No, nothing in the oven. Okay. Anything in the cupboard? Ooh. Really? I don't think they celebrated Halloween in England, but anyway. Guess if you got pumpkins, you can do a pumpkin thing. Um, something pumpkin related. Gloves. Water. Oh, blood. Spooky blood. Um, nah. Um... <clears throat> Okay, let's see for the kitchen, I suppose. So, yeah, for like a manor house, it's not the biggest place in the world, is it? The, I guess this would be the basement. 
of the... Oh, I was expecting like servants quarters, but this is all a bit fancy. Check out the slideshow. Check out Puda. Ghostly glossary. Oh yeah. Yeah, plenty of stuff on... Why is this stuff about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Oh no, they, they did a few like... I No, that's right. They, yeah, there were a few ghost stories mixed in there somewhere. We had to sort out. Screaming Skulls. Yeah. Um, what else is in here though? Probably watch some videos at some point. Um, no, just a bottle of bottle of stuff. Oh, more files. Ghosts and technology. In 1861, William Mumler, a Boston jewelry engraver, developed some photographic plates only to discover that an image of a person appeared next to the subject of the portrait. This person was not present when the photograph was taken, and so Mumler assumed they had produced evidence that spirits of the dead exist and could appear on photographs. A U.S. Court of Appeal judged that the plates were genuine in 1863. Since this incident, technology and the paranormal have been closely linked. Um, and solid evidence. Sophisticated surveillance equipment. Oh, this is that spider thing that I was talking about before. Oh, no, we didn't finish all that. Ghost technology, spider, robo, ghost. The four-strong team, Ghostbusters UK, make use of a computer no, computerized surveillance equipment in their investigations. One member of the team, Rodney Mitchell, has linked various input devices to an Acorn computer to record temperature changes, vibrations, and sound. This machine has been given the name Robo Ghost. The team hope that the collation of print house from Robo Ghost will result in some evidence being uncovered to prove that ghosts exist. An Acorn would have been a bit old in the 90s, though. It wasn't a super powerful computer. Side laboratory tests. Gansfield experiments. Yeah. Someone putting ping pong balls in his eyes. Dinner cards. Oh, and that's it for the thing. What's on the tape, though? Um, do you believe there is fraudulence involved in lab experiments? Rodney Mitchell describes RoboGhost. Yeah, I'll hear about RoboGhost. So. What we have here is um, a computer system that is monitoring a number of sensors which are on the end of wires. So this is one of them which is nearby. This is a temperature sensor, a small, very sensitive sensor which is... Um, feeding information into the computer, which is then being recorded and displayed on the screen as a trace. Now if I grab hold of this, you'll see the uh, the temperature go up along that curve there. Yeah, a bit and hard the to see goes it, up, it's recorded and, uh, into the computer's memory and we can take it off onto a floppy disk and then... Uh, yeah, this is the, this is the days, again. the dark ages um, of uh, machine will give modern warning, computing. This is back in, yeah, a BBC Aircorn worked on a CRT TV. It didn't have an actual monitor. Didn't get monitors on like 80s around, computers. Um, you see the temperature fluctuating. Oh, if you did, they were, like, very small and, like, built into the actual box. I've seen a few like that. Um, oh, no, did they say it continued? Tony Cornell, what experiment? Yeah, no, no. No, stuff this. I want more Christopher Lee, damn it. Go and find Christopher Lee. He's probably haunting this, um, this game as we speak. Uh, what the fuck is that? This fascinating piece of machinery was constructed. <laughs> what is that? Um, it looks like a Nerf gun. Clear. To deal with poorly designed with nerf gun, a terrifying entity of some sort, because people often say to us, "Have you ever been frightened with what you're doing?" We've never actually been frightened, but you never know. If we saw an entity, we could, in fact, literally, like the Ghostbusters, we could sort of, you know, fire a beam of light, and uh, we might have an epileptic ghost if we did that. But um, <laughs> it is a very real. He he's not machinery. even really now, convinced about it himself, it's very complicated, is he? But in brief, on the side of the machinery we have here. Um, a GSR machine, galvanic skin response machine, which you hold in one hand, and if you see something that's frightening, you could sweat. You might not realize you were sweating, but there would be a response in the palm of your hand. This then emits a high-pitched buzz, and if you felt uncomfortable, and you think, my God, people have reported a, a sinister presence there, but I don't actually see anything, you hold this. And if you began to feel uncomfortable, it would be responded, you get a sound here. And then if you wanted to, even though you couldn't see it with your physical eyes, you could nevertheless upset it with that. 
<laughs> just piss it's very off with the light. Like this comedy yeah, right. To decide what is, as it were, subjective or objective. It's something that you think you're going to feel, or is there something really there? On one occasion, we used it when there was something really there. We used it in a deserted church. We fired the beam of light at a swirling green, ominous mist, which exploded into trillions of glistening lights and rushed out of the door and disappeared. Now, we saw it, believe it or believe it not, that doesn't matter to me. But the fact is, it came in useful. We liked the machine, we developed it, and it's fun. But the galvanic skin response fun. machine does help you to decide okay. if you are actually physically responsible. Yeah, these guys are nut jobs, aren't now, they? There's a lot more that could be said, but it's probably beyond the scope of what we're recording just now. <laughs> Fair enough. Really, though. And this is the... Oh, this is the inside of Spider. Okay. Oh, yeah, a little tape recorder. Speaker, for some reason. Little baby keyboard. Oh, that might be a ZX Spectrum, actually. They did have pretty small keyboards, didn't they? And yeah, okay. What's this do? This is a little device that's designed to detect the uh, charged ions in the air. Um, now these ions can be either negative or positive. Um, positive. That's the thing. Like, <laughs> it's sort of hard to um, take anyone seriously when they're wearing like an argyle it jumper. Makes people feel quite good. So um, an excess of positive ions in a room. Would... Okay, now he's going to talk about ions for the next five minutes. What's this thing? Here? is um, a wand sensor. It's a type of thermometer. And the useful thing about that is not only is it on a long lead so we can investigate temperatures physically, but because it has an illuminated digital readout, it's very useful for seeing even in the dark. And the change of temperature yeah, so what's is noticed directly. Now, oh, it's just picking up temperature. A report is yeah, no, no. <laughs> 90s bloody technology. Uh, let's go have some wine. Anything good in the wine bottles? No. Probably a few. I'm sure there's a few good vintages in there somewhere. Um, so this was behind. Oh, there's a dark little scary bit there. What's in the box? I haven't really seen much exciting stuff in the way of, like, actual... I haven't stuck in many jump scares. It's probably for good reason. Anyway, can we watch this thing? Yeah, let's let's check out some slides. The ghosts of old England. Ah, oh, good. We got another uh, video. I hope another slideshow. Come on, Chris. We need you back. Oh, that's it. Just more Photoshop. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of hoping for a voiceover. This might have had a voiceover. <laughs> Someone in a robe. This might be a monk of some sort. Um, yep, can we... Oh, we can use this to skip through. Oh, yeah. Was that... Looks like a lease from Funhouse. Okay. Um, yep. More Photoshop. More spooky stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's the point of the slideshow controller. That's what happens when I click on the, um, that film reel icon. All right, well, out of the cell. I think we don't have too much more left to explore, do we? That was to the, um... Uh, it was a bedroom or something. No, that's where that screaming skull thing was, wasn't it? We don't have much more to explore. Just the two rooms up top. Um, that's it. Just the cupboard. Oh, oh no, the spooks. <laughs> the man doing a Brand Jenkin impression. Yeah, sure, righto. Righto, mate. Uh, more video. Um, skeptics, do you think there's a feasible explanation for every haunting? Please describe how you would disprove the theories of a fervent believer in ghosts. Have you ever experienced you found if ever experienced anything you found inexplicable? Uh, how do you feel when you call, people call you a paranoid disbeliever? Have you ever had a case where people tried to trick you in any way? I'm sure that yeah, that seems yeah. Yes, I had several. I had a very interesting one quite a number of years ago down in Sheerness. Uh, I tried to got a poltergeist, he said. My wife rang up. Very sensible woman. Yeah. No, no. I want some more. I want some more Christopher Lee, damn it. Don't know if we're going to get too much more, though. 
Is there anything in the chest of drawers? Um, check these. Oh, a snake. Spooky snake. Yeah, right. Really. Shush you. Bye, you. Um, nothing else in the drawers, though? No other... Okay. I guess this is the jump scare room. This is apparently where the poltergeist is. Um... If the clock is wound well but still stops, <clears throat> count it as a bad omen. Yeah, right. -o. Right, -o, Chris. All right. Um, nothing on the bed. Probably another audio log with um that photo up there. You gonna let me go to the photo? After cashing up on an evening shift, I put the float in its tray in this filing cabinet um, not the filing cabinet and left the restaurant oh blah 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 anything else good? no just crappy photoshops more of that anything on the half? no um, oh there's got to be something in this mirror surely or the music box pretty good quality music box actually <laughs> it's just like a tiny little organ inside there Yeah. Have you checked your reflection recently? Hmm. Have you checked your reflection recently? Yeah. Do that all the time, Chris. Um Ah oh, here he's the stunning brave ghost hunters. Uh oh, is this their like pamphlet? <laughs> they left their bloody pamphlet on in the game. Oh, there's an actual number though. Um, oh, do we want to call it? That's that's an Australian mobile number though, from the looks of that. Or Robin. I don't. No, I won't worry about it. Just I, I want more Christopher Lee, man. Um. Oh, and that's it for the, the ghost the Ghostbusters UK. Okay. Um, yeah, more videos from these guys. What do ghosts look like? Yeah. That's exciting. I'm going to try and find... I, I remember there being one more story with Christopher Lee. We'll find that and we'll finish up because we're getting on to about an hour and a half. We might see some more spooks somewhere. Um, oh, there's another door through here. More videos from these guys. Have your views on ghosts and hauntings changed over the years? I'm sure they have. The answer lies in Easter. What? Oh, maybe there is stuff that's like locked off that we need to find clues on. Here is a photograph taken in on the Bakerloo line in the tunnel, and we think it took place. The actual <laughs> this photograph. This is just another Photoshop. Dude. Here is two pictures here. Ah, uh, yeah, this is when you get like the, taken by a the overlaid photos a, when a like the film doesn't like Halifax sit in properly when you in take a picture. Club there. Uh, but, uh, been... Two pictures. Yeah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's a, that's a famous one. 1934, okay. The spooks say. I was this kind was of half expecting jump by, scares. Uh, an elderly lady in a private wood in Oxford. Yeah, where's the ghost though? Where's the ghost, huh? Bit of stuff this there. This was Oh, shush. Um, oh, there's something standing behind. Okay, that one's a little creepy. This was taken. Is there any more? Uh... This was taken. Oh, here is hang on, hang on. Two Go through this that. Any more? Yeah. The man in Foster Cathedral. Okay. Um... This was taken by a man in Covent Garden. Taken... A picture of his child here. Yeah, that one's a little creepy. Um, <laughs> just go in the plague mask, yep. Here we have two photographs taken in the Austrian Tyrol by a group of English uh, people who were on holiday for a week. At the end of their holiday, they decided to have a bit of a do in the evening. And uh, they were all sitting around a table having drinks and watching the floor show. And when it was, oh, when the floor that... show was finished... Um... Is that all it is? Just the here we have two photos. No, 
anyway moving along uh we'll check that box last because i reckon there's something significant in that there's a glove yeah if here you we cross go. the north downs in the county of surrey just east of guildford you will come to the tiny hamlet of Shear. continue south for another mile and you will enter hurt wood an ancient and yeah no this is the one i remember because um yeah i used to beneath its heavy do stuff with another fella called vorzak and he actually clothes, lived in guildford and, and mentioned that um will present itself it's banks the lake they're talking willow. about this one was sort of near moss. his house this is the silent pool of legend whose lower depths hold a violent and brooding secret in saxon times the silent pool was a godsend for weary travelers who chanced upon it when losing their way in the forest for emma and philip who lived and worked in the woods it was far more it was their secret place where they could forget the long labors of the day and bathe in the pool's placid waters the daughter and son of benjamin the local woodsman the pair were inseparable and they had taken over many of the daily chores after the recent death of their mother. Emma, the eldest, was a striking beauty who reminded Benjamin so much of his dear wife. Now approaching womanhood, she would soon marry and raise a family of her own. Philip was a lad of strong heart and limb. Philip used to cut his hair using a bowl. The household was beginning to recover from the grief that had stricken it earlier that year when the appearance of a dark stranger changed their lives forever. On an uncommonly hot day in autumn, a finely attired nobleman, hopelessly lost and in need of a drink to slake his powerful thirst, stumbled upon the woodcutter's hut. Unprepared for such a visitor, but knowing the dangerous caprice of such men, Benjamin reluctantly entertained him sharing what little refreshment he had with his taciturn guest. While Philip attended the patrician's steed, Emma served their uninvited caller the last of their water, and then eagerly took her leave to fetch more from her secret refuge. On arriving at the pool, flushed and breathless, Emma felt no compunction to hurry back but instead disrobed and entered the water's cool, inviting embrace. So enchanted was she by the serene beauty of her surrounds that she failed to hear a horse approach until it was too late. The rider burst oh from the woods and reined in his steed at the water's edge near Emma's discarded clothes, uttering not a word. It was her father's mysterious guest and now she turned abruptly from him, clasping her hands around her naked frame. She pleaded with him for her garments, but the man made no move or sound, merely staring at her with an intensity that terrified Emma. And then without warning, he spurred his mount into the pool towards her. Emma's pulse quickened, and she struggled further into the silent waters, though she could not swim. The stranger ignored her entreaties and drove his horse forward. Emma now feared for her life as much as her virtue, and so she waded even further into the pool, the waters growing darker and colder with every step, until her toes could no longer feel the bottom, and still the horseman advanced. <laughs> Sobbing convulsively and now feeling a numbness creep up her flailing legs, Emma screamed as loud as her tightening lungs would allow, instinctively reaching out to the mysterious intruder. The rider merely removed a glove and flung it with casual disdain in the direction of the drowning girl's outstretched hands. Emma let out Just one more dick. frantic yell can give me hand? before sure. her mouth filled with water. Deep in the woods, Philip heard his sister's scream and rushed as fast as his limbs could carry him in the direction of the cry. When he reached the pool, Philip could at first see only the stranger on his steed a short way out from the bank. But then he caught sight of Emma thrashing wildly in the deepest part of the pool. Wading in without a second thought, Philip reached his sister, whose energy had been all but sapped by the icy waters which now enveloped them both. Yet 
he could not keep her head above water, and his own strength began to fail him. In one last desperate lunge, he tried to push his sister towards the bank, but he fell back under the effort, and the pool's inky depths dragged them down slowly and inexorably. They never surfaced again. The stranger scratched his beard idly, turned his horse, and rode off into the forest. Behind him, the waters of the pool stilled over like a glassy sheet, leaving no trace of the tragedy that took place barely moments ago. When his children did not return home that evening, Benjamin desperately searched for them in all the places he knew they liked to dally, and in time came upon the silent pool, but he could see nothing there, and returned home distraught and tired. He would redouble his efforts tomorrow. And so the woodsman continued his search, time and again returning to the pool, until, on one occasion, something caused him to linger by the bank. The noonday sun was just clearing the tops of the trees overhead, its rays playing across the becalmed surface of the pool, when Benjamin was momentarily blinded by the glint of something bright on the far bank. He hurried around to the it's other so side. so bright, I can't got see. There, what he saw <laughs> broke his heart, and he wept like a child. There before him, bobbing near the water's edge, were the pale, bloated bodies of his children, still bonded together after death. He waded in and began to pull them back out when he noticed locked in Emma's frozen grip a silver gauntlet, which had to be prized from her fingers for him to look at it more closely. Standing waist deep yeah, in the accursed pool with the bodies of, this of his dead children floating crime. beside him, Benjamin examined the well? crest on the glove, and his body shook with helpless rage. For the owner of the glove, was not only the self-same lord to whom he gave succor some days before, but also none other than Prince John, Regent of England. Oh, shit. His evil was beyond punishment by any other than God, the same God who had now taken his whole family from him. Do not tarry long at the edge of the silent pool, for you might witness the spirit of the drowning maiden rising from her watery grave, a chilling scream on her lips. There she will stare you dead in the eye, and in a heartbeat and now probably rush towards you across the pool, titties. shimmering, hushed <laughs> surface. Yeah, fair enough. That was an interesting one. Um, so what's left? I'm just going to check this box. And I'll see if it'll let me actually leave the house in case there's something exciting. What's if you want oh! some advice to get ahead, there's more to the laboratory than meets the eye. I'm sorry, there's a laboratory? Ah, oh, crap. So there's stuff I've obviously, like, missed. Um, I don't, well, I don't know if it's actually meant to lead anywhere, though. That's the other thing. I thought this was just one of those, like, explore around and... Click on stuff, games. Um, where would a lab be, though? Was it down in the cellar? Um, nah, let's just leave. I've, I've had enough. Are you sure you want to leave the house now? Yeah, let's, let's get heavy. Yeah, I like the little icons, though. Yeah, alright. That was, that was a bit different. A bit different from what we normally do.